Well, hello and welcome to the skating lesson. This is a special edition of As the Blade Turns with Christine Brennan on location in Switzerland for the CAS hearing about Camila Valjeva. And Christine, you're the only person there, according to your Instagram, that everyone has been following, your Twitter. Christine, what has been going on in Switzerland? Well, good evening, Dave from Switzerland. It's kind of it's late, but it's uh, I'm I'm thrilled to be talking to with you. And uh, yes, what a crazy week it has been. I I decided to come here and cover this. It's a story, as you know. I've been I was covering from the get go, um, from that you know from that crazy day, February seventh. They won the you know the silver medal. The U.S. did gold, silver, bronze. Russia, U.S., Japan. Uh, February 7th, it's 598 days ago, it will be 600 days on Saturday, but who's counting, right? And then, uh, uh, and then within a day, well, then the medal ceremony was canceled. And then I was able to report as, as others were all, we we're all trying to get the story. And I was lucky enough to have a source that uh, told me that it was uh, a minor on the Russian team. And at that point, we just went with the story that it was the Russians. And then a few hours later, added the minor. And of course, the minor was Camilla Valieva, as everybody knows. So I was honored to break that. Um, and and then, you know, I throughout those games, as you know, I was, I was on the story, uh, USA Today, CNN, ABC, et cetera. And it kind of swallowed the Olympics, right? You know, it was one of those stories that just, takes over uh, and, you know, which is not good in the sense of all the other wonderful stories at the Olympics that of course people covered and, but it sure was a very big deal and a huge controversy. And never in my wildest dreams, Dave, did I think when I left Beijing on February 22nd, 2022, I remember because it was 2 anyway. My birthday, yes. <laughs> that, that here we would be at the end of September of 2023, I would be in Lausanne, Switzerland, speaking with you about a hearing that is going on involving the same exact skater and the same exact story. Um, it, it, what are we? Well, more than well, more than a year and a half, eight, 19 months later, and the um, the Russian foot dragging, also known as investigating, you know, took up the better part of a year. And then, you know, WADA, World Anti-Doping Agency, said, hey, we will, we want to, um, you know, we're going to appeal the Russian decision to slap on the wrist, you know, no fault or negligence. And so WADA and the International Skating Union both uh, said, we're going to take this to CAS and they want four-year bans. I just use hedging its bet. Weird. Four or two. <laughs> it's like, you know, make up your mind. But WADA's four-year ban and, of course, disqualification disqualification of Olympic results. And so um, I, I thought when I heard that, that was in June, that they set the date at the end of September. And I thought I, you know, I should be there. And uh, I sh and so I came and everything was moving along well. I was there today. Um, we can discuss the actual physical situation, which is uh, a fascinating to me, how closed and secretive and shrouded in secrecy the whole thing is, which I hope has been illuminating uh, that I've been able to write that and talk about that, send pictures, hope people have had a chance to see that and and judge it as they as they wish. Um, but uh, I, I'm there, I'm the only journalist there today in the press room at, at the CAS headquarters. And all of a sudden I get a text from a source um, that's saying uh, they've adjourned. And I said, what does that mean, adjourned? And well, they, because the hearing's supposed to be over. So I would have thought I would have heard the hearing is over. No, they've adjourned to November 9th. And I, I, I still, I'm going back and forth. What, what does that mean? And then the CAS uh, spokeswoman actually handed me the uh, release, which I then took a quick picture of and put on Twitter. And um, being there, obviously, it was, I, I was the only one that she was handing it to. And, uh, uh, it was that they've got you know more documentation that they want to look at, and Dave, how on earth, close to 600 days, all this time, all these months, weeks, months, you know, days, hours, everything, and now there's new documentation. So um, truly uh, stunning, and and you know this story has kind of been stunning from from the very beginning, but um, bizarre. And what I thought of immediately. And what I've written now, I've got a, 
a story, new story out and a column just up um, that uh, as soon as we're done, I'll, I'll put out on, on uh, social media. And, you know, you think of th those athletes, you think of the Americans, the nine Americans, you think of the Japanese athletes, the Canadians who would move up from fourth to third if Valley was found guilty and the waiting. And now, of course, what this pushes it back six weeks. So the deliberations, which can take between one and three months, will now start, the clock starts November 10th. 9th and 10th will be the, the, the end of this hearing, they presume. We'll see. And so now we're talking January, February. So basically, we're talking about the, the two-year anniversary of uh, the winning the the um the silver medal for the US. And you know what uh, last thought on this is I'm I'm sorry I'm talking so much but it is you know obviously it's something that um I've been reporting on and been living with uh here the last 4 days. But you know you think about a medal ceremony at the Olympics and I love medal ceremonies at the Olympics. I've been so honored and lucky to cover uh 20 Olympics in a row. I started when I was in kindergarten, of course, uh, LA in 84, all the way through, you know, to uh, Beijing, looking forward now to Paris, number 21 for me uh, uh, in uh, next summer. And the medal ceremony is really the simplest thing you could imagine at the Olympics. So uncomplicated, really, you know, the athletes are there and someone, some Puba, some IOC member gets up there or someone and puts a medal around their their neck and they get the flowers and then the anthem is played for the for the gold medalist it's the simplest and it's really the loveliest thing and to think of those skaters obviously the russians don't have their medals but we that's we know why you know everything stood time stood still because of them and because of Valieva. but the u.s and the japanese these wonderful athletes um and they don't they've never had that and uh I think that's one of the, that's definitely the, the story is huge for me. And it's a very important uh, journalistic uh, experience for me. Something it's like a journalism adventure to be here and to do this. And, and I love that. And I love breaking news and I love writing about this and talking about this. And I also feel strongly to do it for those athletes and, and just, you know, I've got this ability to be here and ask questions and, to, you know, if people don't like me being here, great, you know, uh, I couldn't care less. That means I'm doing my job and I, I can do my job and try to help and and at least ask questions. And so um, that has been an honor for me always. And I'll continue to do that. And, um, you know, obviously the story <laughs> to be continued, which is I'm, I'm laughing, but it's it's truly sad and unbelievable that we're at this point in this story. Well, what does it say about the state of the sport that you are the only journalist there and the state of the Olympics? I'm thinking about the New York Times closing their, you know, sports section and everything that has changed in media, you know, over the last years. And I was just thinking as you were speaking, that was, was 1997 the last time you were in Lausanne for a figure skating event when Tara Lipinski beat Michelle Kwan and how many journalists were there then? And if this happened back then, would you be the only journalist here? It's just, it's really unfathomable to me. One, that it's behind closed doors. And two, that you're the only journalist there. I mean, where are all of the journalists from Russia who would be obviously reporting on, you know, those interests? Yeah, I I, I don't know why there weren't Russian journalists here. Now, uh, for all I know, they were around, but they certainly weren't anywhere I was. And that was in front of the building. And uh, when watching people come and go, and then in the press room, I mean, that it, it would logically, you know, th that would be where, where, where if you're covering the event, you would, you would come in and they did allow us in the building. So it's not, we stood outside, I stood outside and I will say there were two other, uh, uh, for Tuesday morning, mm -hmm. um, the first day, the Associated Press, uh, a reporter and another journalist who was actually working the camera, the video camera. Uh, for the arrivals, to get all the arrivals and to do uh, to interview the WADA spokesman, and so that was um, that was Tuesday morning. So they were both uh, they're both headquartered and stationed uh, in Geneva. So they came over from Geneva uh, for for a few hours, but then they left, uh, and I was still there for gosh three or four hours that day Tuesday, and then I've been the only one since. So what does that say? Um, it, well, it's certainly a, st a statement, as you know well, uh, of where we are in journalism in general. Um, obviously, budgets are tight. The idea of sending journalists anywhere can be really difficult right now. Um, I will say, because it's not a secret, that I 
um, decided this was important enough that I decided to pay my own way to do this. Um, I, I can do that and I wanted to do that. And I also wouldn't want USA Today to, to pay for this out of a budget that I hope that our, my colleagues and other journalists, especially younger journalists, can go to some events where, of course, I would, I would never want this, this kind of expense to be something that they would have to, you know, that all of a sudden that could, you know, certainly break the budget for September or something. You know, I wouldn't want to do that. So, so again, I'm at the stage where I can do that and I'm honored and very fortunate to be able to do that. Uh, and I feel I should do that. So that's that for me, obviously it is, you know, you're flying you know, to Europe to cover something. Uh, it's something that you can cover from home. You know, uh, I don't think you can do it. Well, I know you can't do it as well as I could do it from here because I know, for example, I'm getting that piece of paper telling me what happened today with the uh, very sudden and surprising adjournment. And I would have eventually seen that probably somehow online and then be able to written it from Washington, but not at all like here. And, uh, and just being around something, I mean, just the energy of, of being the, your energy as a journalist, you know, my energy to be able to, you know, to, uh, to go to these places and see these places and, and get a chance to uh, be inside of the CAS headquarters in the press room and, and talk to the spokesman for WADA and, and meet and, and talk with the CAS uh, communications officer, even though she did not want to be quoted. So, you know, that's all very, very helpful in terms of reporting. And just what you see, you know, I'm in the Alps and right now it's obviously dark, but if I could show you, you know, right there's like Geneva out my window and then the French Alps and then the Swiss Alps are this way. It's spectacular. I mean, the view is just extraordinary out the balcony. And so just being here and being around it is, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, I'm, I'm super lucky to be able to be here and, and to enjoy it. It's certainly not a bad place to be working for a week, you know. Um, so all of that being said, I think it's economics. You know, I think it's just the financial situation of the newspapers. You mentioned the New York Times, and that is so sad. Uh, some dear friends work there. Many dear friends over the you know, past have worked there. Colleagues, competitors, wonderful, classy people who have now been reassigned to the business desk or whatever. It, it's And maybe they'll cop, drop into sports. They'll maybe drop into the Olympics, whatever. But it's just so different. Um, so that's certainly um, terrible. You know, that's just... but. But how many people watching us right now? I mean, I, is anyone buying a newspaper anymore? And, I, and I, I'm not criticizing people if they're not, because I've gotten so used to I'm looking at you on my iPhone right now. But I absolutely read newspapers on the New York, New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, Wall Street Journal. I, I read on my iPhone and I'm so used to it. But, um, you know, just the demise of the print edition, which is uh, obviously devastating financially because the ads and the amount of money that 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 you generated and what uh, people would pay, you know, advertisers would pay to be in the newspaper. And we haven't figured out yet, and maybe we won't, I don't know, how to monetize, really monetize uh, the online product. So there's been so many changes. Most of your viewers know this already, um, but it is, I, I'm a realist and this is reality, but it, it's, it, it saddens me greatly. Um, so many of my colleagues took buyouts or were laid off or, or just decided, you know, to go on to another career and to lose those wonderful people I went to college with or whatever, to lose them from journalism is really, really tough. Um, so I, I am surprised that I was the only one there today. Um, I'm surprised I was the only one there for most, you know, a huge percentage, a big percentage of the day, uh, Tuesday, maybe it's more than 50% because I, you know, those guys left and that made sense. They did their work and then they, they went back home to Geneva uh, and they're good guys and, and good reporters. But uh, yeah, I, I guess I would have thought someone would have come, um, but they didn't. And I did come and that's a, you know, that's a, a situation that is presents itself that I have no control over. And at that point, I want to take full advantage of that situation as well as a journalist and as a, a you know someone who's competitive and, and wants to have the the story. So it it it's um, you know it was the reality of the situation. And uh, but standing outside, I will say it was kind of surreal because you know I've been thinking about it for a, long, a few weeks as I planned to come. You know, stand outside. Will they let me in? Well, yeah, they let you in. Go to the press room. By the way, the press room was on the second floor. 
and the meeting room was on the third floor. And I never, ever spotted the three arbitrators. They were coming and going from the, the uh, parking lot, the parking garage. So uh, they went in that way, which I don't blame them, you know, they didn't, uh, but it wasn't as if it looked like a, you know, a Donald Trump scene at the, at the courtroom, you know, or, a, or any major here uh, trial we've seen with the, with the huge, you know, gaggle and, and just, you know, incredible swarm of, of cameras, not at all. And so, um, but I did watch some lawyers and, and other experts come and go for sure. And um, it was, I, I, as I said, I was glad to eyeball it, glad to see it, glad to witness it and glad to see what it looked like. Yeah, yeah I, I mentioned that about the other reporters because, you know, having several hundred thousand people that follow Facebook, you get a myriad of comments with people that have a different level of knowledge uh, based on the situation. So anytime something is posted about Beijing, Valjeva, the teams, everyone will ask, did those Americans get their medals yet? Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, the answer is no. Uh, you know, And uh, I think it's interesting, you also take a lot of heat because you do report on you know, things that people aren't just celebrating uh, in figure skating, but you are the only one doing it. And the other reporters have you know, exited, as you said, and, and I think that the sports world does suffer because of that. So I wanna thank you for being there uh, and doing this. And I was wondering where you think the Olympic movement is because figure skating in general has felt like it's in a state of paralysis since that team event at the Olympics. Yes, events have gone on, but it's been in this strange world where you have the cognitive dissonance that no, the team never got their medals and this has been unresolved. So how do you think this you know moves forward and, and at what point does the IOC force it to uh, come to a conclusion? And of course, as you know well, what happened within a week of that you know, the, the Olympics ending in Beijing, of course, is we had the, you know, the Russians invading Ukraine. And so throw that in the mix, obviously that is far more serious mm -hmm. and awful, the horrors of that compared to this controversy we're talking about involving, you know, medals uh, at the Olympics, of course, but it's intertwined in the sense that, you know, clearly the Russians, it, uh, if we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they would have investigated them, you know, and this is Rusada, the Russian anti-doping agency, which as I've written several times, but is the oxymoron to end all oxymorons, the Russian anti-doping agency, they actually were suspended, the, the anti-doping agency for three years from 2015 to 2018, because they helped Russian athletes cheat. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't make this stuff up. It's and they couldn't do their own testing at, in 2021 in December, which is why this was sent. The, the sample was sent was to sent, Switzerland. Right. Well, uh, Sweden, I believe it was, wasn't Sweden. it? Um, Sweden, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, one of those countries that begins with us. And uh, the, um, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so, right. If they, if they, well, their lab is closed because of all the cheating, but, and we want that to be the case because you can't trust it anyway. But, so they send it out, but then they don't say, hey, by the way, we need this in a few weeks because it's the Olympics. I mean, that's where this whole thing just fell apart right away. You know, they, I, I one could surmise, and I, I would not report this, but as we're chatting here, it, it certainly is within the realm of possibility that the Russians knew exactly what was going on uh, with Valieva, potentially, and others, who knows? Um, the coaches, I, again, I have no idea, but this is a scenario that's possible. Um, I'm not saying it's true, but it's possible. And so they decided, well, let's just slow walk the, the drug testing where I've talked to others involved with other national anti-doping agencies. And you purposely tell a lab, you would like call the lab, email the lab and say, we need this. You wanna know, and I'll give you an example. The US with Shakari Richardson, of course, who tested positive for marijuana, Huge controversy whether that should be on ban list. It is. She knows it. She knew it. And the U.S. found out, and of course, and and she tested positive, and that prevented her from going to the Tokyo Olympics. If we if we were going to have the same U.S. to Russia situation, if the U.S. did what Russia did with Valieva, potentially anyway, um, that you would have a situation where the U.S. would have would have somehow buried that or not want it. We don't want to know it, you know, don't tell us, we don't want to hear it. And um, sent Richardson to the Olympics. That's what the Russians did with Valieva. Now, 
it's also possible that it was it was just incompetence and they didn't tell anyone. Uh, but, you know, our friends, the Russians, it, you, you've got to ask whether or not they plan this exactly this way, because, as you know, as, as well as anyone from talking and, and all the you know the shows and everything you, you, you talk about, Believa, uh, you know, was Peggy Fleming and Dorothy Hamill and Katerina Vitt, right? I mean, like she's the one. And here she comes to the Olympics and sure enough, leads Russia to victory in the team competition. And she's favored, of course, a week and a half later to win the gold and then finishes fourth because of all the, the weight of the world on her shoulders and the pressure that because of the scandal um, that Russia gave us uh, itself. So anyway, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, you've got if if Russia does its job and gets the test result in time or tells the lab to get the result to them in time, they know Valier was tested positive and she doesn't go to the Olympics and none of this happens. So you asked, you know, how where skating is. Um, I think, you know, the Russian thing, if you can't trust a sport and you can't trust what you're watching, right, then it becomes uh, really problematic. And we've seen that with track and field. Track and field used to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated, gosh, five or six times a year. I know because I got Sports Illustrated and it would be all the runners and, and the track stuff, you know, everyone. I, one of the most amazing little trivia, piece of trivia, 1983 Sportsman of the Year for Sports Illustrated, 1983, was Mary Decker Slaney. Um, and that was it. There was no, sport. you know, she was the sportsman, sports person of the year for Sports Illustrated on the cover. And it was because she had a great world track and field championships in Helsinki. 1983, we're not talking about an Olympic year. A track and field athlete was picked because of her world championships. And also then of course, heading into the 84 Olympics in LA. Uh, that would never happen. First of all, you'd never see track and field on the cover of anything anymore, except a track and field magazine probably. And why? Because I believe of st steroids. I think the sport took such a hit with Ben Johnson and so many others um, that it's really tough. And I'm not trying to pick on track and field. I love covering it, but it just, it's really disappeared in terms of our culture, mm -hmm. cover Sports Illustrated, whatever. And so sports do have a way of coming and going and, and trust and is everything. So um, I'm not, figure skating is still beloved. You know that. We all know how many people love it. Uh, it it's, I, it's not going away, but everything is basically a niche sport except the NFL. And um, that's where we are with all sports, even Major League Baseball in some ways, and it, it's just kind of a niche sport. So the TV ratings aren't there and they're gonna get worse, not better with streaming and everything else that's out there for people. So I, I think, um, but skating has to get its act together. And if they continue to allow, first of all, the Russians shouldn't even be at the Olympic games, right? The 2014 state-sponsored doping scheme, putting the, the vials through the hole in the wall, getting the clean urine back. I mean, that should have been, they should have been kicked out for 2016, 2018, at least. But each time they kind of got let back in or half of them came back or a third. And so you've never punished, the IOC's never punished Russia or they wanted to punish and then somehow they got let back in. So until you just kick the Russians out of an Olympics or two, you, no, the, the Olympic world, figure skating every part of the world in sports, Dave, should not be surprised when the Russians cheat because that's what they do because that's what they did in 2014 when they were never properly punished. And um, so this is just another example, like we're shocked that Russians are cheating at the Olympics and, and literally blocking out the sun from any other story, you know? Uh, no, we shouldn't be surprised because that's what the Russians do. And I'm afraid they'll continue to do it uh, until they're finally banned from a couple of Olympics. And even then, and of course they're probably, they, Ukraine, that's one of the reasons they won't, a lot of them won't be at the Olympics next year in Paris. But this is a, this is a, an issue that is huge and it's not gonna go away anytime soon. There's no doubt about that. I feel like an idiot for even asking you this question, but I would like you to clarify something for viewers because sure. a lot of Russians who watch this will use the same argument in the comments that they have used for years and they will attack Simone Biles who is competing at the uh, World Gymnastics Championships this coming week. Uh, and they will point out that she had a therapeutic use exemption for Ritalin. Can you explain what the difference between doping and a therapeutic use exemption is in this situation? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you are following the rules and if you respect the rules, um, and if you say, 
uh, have asthma. A lot of people have asthma, including people who don't have asthma. <laughs> That's another story. Uh, we've seen that over the years in sports, um, which means that could be uh, performance enhancing or trying to you know, sneak something in. But in general, if you've got an issue and you've got a doctor who says it's this is an issue, like Simone, and you put it on your form, mm -hmm. these athletes are constantly putting down what they're taking, if, if they're not cheating, if they're doing it the right way, if they respect the rules, and you put it down and you show that you're using it and the doctor, you know, if there's any doubt, there's, you know, there's questions or you can you know, obviously uh, have some, you know, in this would in this case, it would be US, the US Anti-Doping Agency would see what's going on here and check it out. Um, and once that's there and it has gone through the process of, of being legitimatized by the National Anti-Doping Agency of that athlete, then that's legit. That is seen as legit. Now, I guess there are those who could say, Dave, well, I could find any doctor to write this, this mm -hmm. down. Well, that's why it's checked out. That's why if all of a sudden something pops up that an athlete's never had before, mm -hmm. um, if all of a sudden there's something that uh, you know doesn't look right, or for example, athletes in the past have you know said, "Oh, I I need this," you know, for for whatever reason, but uh, then they never put it on their on their sheet and on in their to put in their history or on the online, you know, to make sure to document it. That happens all the time. So, you know, I think that's that's a big part of it. Now, what. I guess our friends, the Russians could say is, well, she, yes, she got a doctor to do it, but it helps her. It's a performance enhancing uh, drug. Well, Simone, I think if anyone has shown that she is a real person and she has dealt with things and she needs to work through them and she um, obviously has, as we know, the twisties, as we know, um, her fears, her concerns. Um, you know, this is a woman who's been incredibly honest with uh, the American public and with the, with the, the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, sure, they might say that. But then I I would say back, you know, to them, what what Simone is not doing is she's not lying or changing her story, right? I mean, at least I've not heard of any of that. Um, she's very consistent, and consistency is to me as a journalist is something you look for with any athlete's story, whether it's medicine or with his performances. If someone all of a sudden drops their time like crazy in swimming, well then, okay, how did that happen? Um, or track and field, you know, and it's out of, out of it's not characteristic, right? It's not part of, of what you're used to with that athlete. Well, Simone has been completely honest about everything. You know, look at Valieva. Um, she says, oh, my grandfather, you know, this was my grandfather's. But then her mom had said in another interview that there were two other heart medicines that she was taking that weren't banned. Okay, so what is it? Because now she's got the the trimtazidine and then these other two that her mom it's said she's taking. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a lot of heart medications for a 15 year old. Okay. But then no, it's it's grandpa's that somehow got in her fingertips or something. But, okay, but then what about the other two? Mm -hmm. You know, so immediately you go, okay, so there's someone not telling the truth here. And I don't see that ever happening with Simone. I also would say this uh, to the Russians, I will be the first to say, as someone who's covered both of these athletes extensively and written many columns uh, um, criticizing them, Lance Armstrong, and Marion Jones are the worst his and her drug cheats in sports history. And the United States gave the world those two people, right? Lance Armstrong, American, Marion Jones, American. Absolutely, look it up folks, you can Google it. I've, I've written and talked a lot about them and very critical um, as you might imagine. Uh, what Marion Jones and what Lance Armstrong did was against their nation's drugs, anti-doping wishes. They did not do what their nation wanted them to do. They did what their nation did not want them to do. They went against it and were punished severely for it. Uh, lost everything and deservedly so. So 
what the Russians with their doping scheme in 2014, and we could even go further to, you know, what we would presume even to now with, with uh, Rusada being what Rusada is, is that when they were doping, certainly in 2014 in Sochi, that was uh, with the blessing mm -hmm. of the Russian government, with the Russian, um, you know, sports system. That was part of the plan. It's the state-sponsored doping scheme. So my biggest thing and the difference between the U.S. and Russia would be that, yes, drug cheats in America, we've got them. You bet we do. And the biggest and the worst ever. But but they were going against what their country wanted and were caught by their nation. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, the Russians aren't catching anybody. And all they're doing, as we know, is delaying and dithering and, you know, around and and not doing what the what Rusad is supposed to be doing. So the huge difference there is what this the government itself wanted Russian athletes to do and what the government well, the government of the US wasn't involved but the what US, US anti-doping agency wanted the US athletes to do obviously was not dope and what Russia was doing of course is they were encouraging doping. Well, how about uh, our friend, Dr. Shvetsky, Dr. Philip Shvetsky, who works with Xenon and Gas, and he's worked very closely with the Terry Tuberidza, Nina Mosher, and others. After he gave Valgeva uh, the Shvetazidin, he also is believed to have given, you know, Ekaterina Bobrova meldonium when she tested positive for that at the 2016 Europeans. He gave seven rowers things in 2007. I mean, he has an illustrious history um, of really ruining the careers of many athletes. I find it very interesting that the Russian Skating Federation continues to work closely with him. He was in photograph with Tamara Masvina and her team over the summer. He continues to be present at figure skating competitions. Can you see any scenario where someone who has doped so many athletes and caused so many problems would still be around a national governing body in any sport with such a history? I cannot imagine uh, that happening in the United States in large part because of the media, right? We have, uh, I mean, look what just happened at Michigan State and football, right? The coach had to resign, um, you know, the Me Too movement, sexual assault, uh, allegations of sexual misconduct are taken so seriously, um, among other things, right? So just the openness of our society, we would we would be covering that and, and you would be reading about it and it eventually would go to safe sport. And I know safe sport can be, uh, you know, really uh, can be infuriating for people, but they also, it's the best thing that we've got going on this front um, and it needs to be funded much more. So, you know, I think I, I mean, we we know about it because we have a free press and we have, uh, even as we were talking a little while ago about lamenting uh, the lack of journalists covering the Olympic movement, uh, but we have lots of journalists who would cover something like that. And you've seen that, we've seen great reporting. I've been honored to be a part of in the reporting on the sexual assault and sexual misconduct and abuse, um, uh, going back to the gymnastics uh, story, the horrors there with Larry Nasser. Of course, U.S. figure skating and the and the stories I've uh, broken. Um, Ashley Wagner comes to mind for sure, um, and her uh, honesty and and you know, the tragedy of, of John Coughlin, his alleged abuse, and then also sadly, of course, tragically taking his life, own life. Um, so I, I think we do. We just know it, right? And so there'd be there'd be documentaries, there'd be news, you know, it'd be TV, radio, newspapers, websites. And there'd be coverage of that. Now that having been said, you know, we hear a lot about entourages, right? And I know that I've been asked, and I, I don't know that I've dealt with it a little bit in, in reporting on, on this whole uh, Valieva story, but why aren't we hearing about the entourage, which of course would include, that's the coaches, doctors, you know, that would include the whole shebang. And when I asked that the other day, I was talking with someone who's involved with all of, of this. And they said, well, as long as Camilla Vallier was going with the grandfather excuse, that it was her grandfather's heart medicine, angina medicine. You know, yeah. Um, but as long as she's going with that story, and we, because it was a closed hearing, we don't know if that's what she is still going with, right? which of course would tell you everything if she if they're changing the stories all the time. But as long as she does that, I was told, that then you can't bring a Terry into it because it's her grandfather's drug. And so what Cass has to do, presumably, is not buy that excuse, right? 
and say that would be a decision we will now find out, you know, it'll be 2024 before we hear that decision now based on this six week delay. And so what CAS, what they will do is they will decide if they believe Valley Avon, the gift grandfather thing, if in fact, that's what she said the other day in her testimony or not. And, but if the grandfather thing were to hold, which I can't imagine, but then that is how, she, according to, would be according to Cass in this scenario, that would be how she got the drug in her system. Again, I don't think they're going to go for this, but if they do, well, then it's not the entourage, is it? Because it's grandpa. Now, what I believe will happen, again, based on being on another floor and out, you know, nowhere near the uh, the hearing room, but my guess will be, because these, these are three arbitrators, um, and two of them are highly respected and well-known, and the others was the choice of the Russians, and I don't know anything about him, but I've got to believe that they will throw out the grandfather decision, uh, or the grandfather excuse. Well, then, if in fact they find Valieva guilty, if they do, and as a 15, then 15-year-old 15 protected person, a minor, I truly think that a possibility would be just a slap on the wrist, mm -hmm. um, which would I think would be terrible but, uh, and just a total miscarriage of justice, but it's possible, right? It is certainly possible that they could make that decision. But if they don't make that decision, if they are actually find her guilty and they don't buy the grandfather excuse, as I understand it, that could open the door because then it wouldn't be grandpa, it would be the entourage, theoretically, again, depending on what the testimony is that they're hearing, what the facts, what the science that they've just heard over the last three days. If the panel, the cast panel decides that it then was some other, something else other than uh, other than this grandpa, you know, ridiculous excuse. And if she's guilty, I think then they can start to look at the entourage. I think that would open the door for it. And that would be exactly what you're talking about, including the doctor. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. But that's a long way down the road, as you know, Dave. It is, nothing's happening anytime soon. Yeah, and I know that they've already mentioned the possibility for appeal in Russia, which would obviously delay the medals even further. Just to think about this, have you heard any actual arguments about what kind of documentation they asked for today? Because that was ostensibly the reason for the delay. If you know, they submit arguments ahead of time, so there would have been information presented for the court. Is this a situation where they're asking if Grandpa Valyev, who was thousands of miles away, mind you, when uh, Valyeva was competing at the Russian Championships, mind you, there's a travel day, there's a practice day, there's, I, I mean, how much trimetazidine did she ingest, Christine, when she was drinking from his water glass if she's thousands of miles away at the Russian championships days into the event. I'm just bringing that up. I feel like no one has said this, but again, I mean, you know, you know how long the airport takes. I mean, there's a security line alone, the half-life of trimetazidine. <laughs> you can buy trimetazidine on drdoping.com <laughs> under energy. Okay. I'm just <laughs> pointing a couple of things out. It's next to meldonium, which the Russians have also loved. Um, for years at the university games, if you do a little research. Yes. There. Well, even uh, the Soviets, the Meldonium goes back to the Soviets uh, fighting in Afghanistan. And they, they yeah. as I understand it, they used it to keep the soldiers awake. Yes. And you when know. Meldonium was banned, Russian coaches said, we'll have to find another drug. Well, I mean, I, maybe they did. Um, okay. Yeah. Why on earth are they delaying? What could they possibly need to find out at this yeah. point? What I understand happened, uh, I don't, I don't, I mean, I wish I knew, of course, if I knew I'd tell you, I, I would have already had it on, online, you know, and, and uh, in my uh, story and column, but I, I, I don't know. But as I understand, there was something new that came up and that had, that surprised, it was, you know, some surprise that there's a, uh, something that one of the parties wants to see that wasn't in the files. I mean, and I, the column that I've written that by the time this is up, the column will be online. I, I mean, really, there's something new after 598 days, like, right? Um, obviously that first year was just all the, you know, Rusada delays, but now you've had, I mean, it was, um, gosh, April, I, I, when, no, no, excuse me, it was February when WADA said, we're going to appeal the cast. And then in June, three months ago, they announced that it would be the end of September, cast it, that they would have the hearing. So all of these months, <laughs> and now there's something new. Um, 
it, it might, you know, and of course, Travis Tiger and I quote the uh, USADA CEO and he's like, you know, this reeks of the Russians delaying again, but he doesn't know. And it's also possible, Dave, that what the Court of Arbitration for Sport decided today was that they were going to give everyone more time. Maybe the Russians wanted that for whatever this is, whatever, you know, tactic this is, or if it's really something, although again, unbelievable that there would be something new at this point in this uh, incredibly long saga, but that maybe they said they don't want, they want to give the Russians what they want so that they can't then come back and appeal it and say, you didn't give us more time. Mm -hmm. Now, again, at this point, I, I don't know how a normal human being would be just completely exasperated with the Russians. But then you go back to, we're talking about a then 15 year old. And that protected person thing is a significant piece of this equation. Absolutely. And, you know, um, you throw that in the mix. So maybe the arbitrators looked and said, you know what? We got a 15 year old. Now she's 17, we got a 15 year old. She's a minor. She's a protected person. Let's give them six more weeks. I, I, I you know, I don't know, but that's certainly a, an educated guess. Um, and I, I have a little information that I kind of, you know, put that together. So, uh, I wish I knew, I wish I knew what, what, what secret document they need, um, and why, by the way, it takes six weeks. Now, maybe people have their schedules, right? These are lawyers, you know, that, but the idea that why couldn't they all get on zoom in a couple of days, right? I, I don't. Yeah. And, and again, I think of Evan and Maddie and, and Nathan and Karen and, and, uh, Obviously, you know, Vincent, forgetting, I mean, not forgetting the, the dancers, the pairs, you know, the Vincent, of course. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, you know, the um, the thought of of all of them, all nine of them um, hearing this news today and just knowing it's just going to keep going and going. That's wrong. And um, and it's 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 terrible. And I will say they have great support, not only uh, U.S. figure skating CEO Tracy Merrick, uh, sent me a, a comment, um, uh, or, or you know, the PR staff sent me a comment from Tracy, and then also the U.S. Uh, Olympic and Paralympic Committee. The CEO Sarah Hirschland is also said they're standing with U.S. Figure Skating and understanding the frustration. So, you oh, know, the uh, offered to have a medal ceremony on the plaza for them in New York. I mean, <laughs> when this is all resolved, I mean, it's Hoda's on top of it. You know, I mean, but this is really, I think you have to think about. The major criticism that it happened with the Terry before this was the short shelf life of the careers of her skaters. And Camila Valieva's career could be over before this is resolved. They're already saying that she may not compete at their internal Grand Prix competition because of this case, which obviously she wouldn't be allowed to if she's officially banned because she's been in this quasi accused but not banned status for the last number of years and if they want to be allowed back in they would have to ban her even from national competitions it's very strange it continue i mean we've seen her skate with the hood over her head to tell us that this was all a media conspiracy this year she's skating to the black panther i mean suzanne it's I mean, christine it's just really a, a, a bizarre scenario that just continues to go on and now Diana Davis and Gleb Smolkin are training in the U.S. Terry's daughter going to represent Georgia. I mean, this story gets stranger and stranger. Well, it does. It does. And, you know, let's, you know, extrapolate sometime, hopefully before we're not all dead, you know, there'll be a medal ceremony or they'll, they'll want to have a medal ceremony. Well, if it does is determined that Russia keeps the gold, yeah. which certainly is a, a possible outcome. I mean, it absolutely could happen that they decide to have, you know, she's not guilty, protect your person, whatever. Then, you know, then it stays Russia, US, Japan. Well, you know, the idea of having some cool medal ceremony at the Paris Olympics has certainly been floated. Uh, I've written it, talked about it. Uh, how cool would that be, right? Well, there's no way on earth you can have a medal ceremony, especially, to, you know, the Paris, Paris organizers would say, absolutely no way, Dave. If you can't have Russia on the top of the metal podium and you can't have them playing a national i mean you just could never do that with russia still having invaded and still fighting that horrible war in ukraine because the odds are there will be very few russian athletes at the paris olympics and they won't be russia right they're going to have to be some independent uh country or independent group of athletes and so um 
I'm, you know, probably even less, I mean, you know, no flag, no anthem, all that. Well, then you can't bring Valieva and the group in to get their medal. I mean, that just would be disastrous. So what will probably happen is they'll probably FedEx <laughs> the medals to the Russians. Because <laughs> uh, I don't think they're, I, I'm going to guess by that point, the International Olympic Committee might be so exasperated. <laughs> I have no idea. But with the Russian, like, here. Uh, or Russia can go ahead and have its own medal ceremony, right? And then the U.S. maybe would have its own or maybe U.S. and Japan together, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. U.S. maybe in Colorado Springs uh, have a really, you know, really cool ceremony. They get the medals. Um, I mean, maybe even have the, you know, maybe have it at the White House with the president. I, you know, who knows, right? I mean, whatever you can think of that would be uh, just you know, be really, uh, you know, great, cool, and deserving. You know, something they deserve, the uh, the nine Americans. And then the Japanese would have their, get their bronze medals that way. So, but again, Russia's screwing this up because if if Russia, win, I mean, the U.S. will be very, is very happy with, they were very pleased, as you know, with the silver, right? Uh, U.S. won bronze in, in 2014 in the team competition, the first time that they had it. And then in 2018, they won bronze again. So they moved up to silver. This was a great achievement. There was nothing wrong with the silver, quite, quite the opposite. It was a really great result for the U.S. So they're happy with that, right? Just, you know, have, get the medal, for heaven's sakes. And bottom line is, so you've got that, but... If Russia is still number one, then that even prevents any kind of an Olympic ceremony mm -hmm. for these wonderful athletes who have been so patient and waiting. Um, now, again, if, if they turn out, then they do disqualify the Russian result and do suspend Believa. Now, let's see what happens, because now you've got U.S., Japan and Canada. Would the International Olympic Committee want them to do something at the Paris Olympics? Obviously, Summer Olympics, these are winter athletes. But you could see that as long as Russia is not on the top of that podium, Russia on the top of the podium, you can't celebrate Russia at, at the Paris Olympics, but U.S. on the top, you could. And so there's still that chance, obviously, if like a thousand other things happen before you get to that point. Well, would WADA appeal if Valieva is found not guilty? No, you can't. At this point, yeah. Cass is it. Cass is like the Supreme Court, you know, figure Think of it that way, right? That everyone should think of it that way. The Supreme Court for sports. Um, what the only appeal that is possible out of a cast decision is on a on um, a technicality, on something procedural, which could be something like today. Mm -hmm. As weird as that sounds, you know, like they didn't let us have more time, right? Something again, whatever. And so. <laughs> If there is something like that, not on the issue, not like grandpa's drugs mm -hmm. versus, you know, a Terry, you know, teen, you know, entourage, you know, the entourage giving her this stuff or whoever, not that, but something more of a technical, you know, like a procedural thing that didn't get done properly, then that can go to the Swiss, a Swiss, uh, uh, a court of appeals, mm -hmm. um, there's a name of it. I don't at this day, hour at uh, midnight or whatever. I don't. I don't have it at the top. But it, but there is a Swiss court, Swiss that that you can appeal cast decisions. That's it. That's the only appeal. So I think we can safely say, if I can safely say anything about this particular story, that has had more twists and turns than anything other than maybe like Tanya and Nancy. Um, obviously, very different stories. The cast decision long awaited, uh, much discussed, when that cast decision is rendered. And now the odds will be, if they do the November 9th, 10th, then let's add, let's do December, January, throw in the holidays, let's say end of January or February. Let's say that's when you are sitting at your desk and I'm sitting at my desk and everyone else, and all of a sudden, um, I'd love to break that news, but I have a feeling that will be just announced by Cass. Um, that the Court of Arbitration for Sport has decided and they give the decision that that will be final mm -hmm. and our long national nightmare will be over. <laughs> and I'm not making light of it at all, mm -hmm. except uh, at some level, you just have to just shake your head and, um, and just laugh and, and disgust at how, how it just unbelievable this story is. But yeah, uh, barring some technical procedural thing, which could have been this today thing, which maybe is why that it, they did what they did. Um, Kat, that decision, when we get that decision, no more appeals, that decision is final.
Well, I have to thank you so much for talking to us late at night. And I have to say of the stories I've heard of you and a source, I think I've heard about you being in the bathroom of uh, an Olympics with a source talking about something under a bathroom stall. Uh, you obviously the gas station with Ryan Lotke, you know, <laughs> Tanya's rink <laughs> in Portland. Christine, thank you for being on the case for us. Always a pleasure. No, Dave, no, really, uh, thank you. And and if the skaters are watching, you know, I love to talk and, and continue to tell your story. Um, you know, I, I'm honored to do that and honored to be able to. Uh, and, you know, what this is what journalism is. Sometimes, you know, people like me and sometimes people don't like me. And, and that means I'm doing my job. But part of my job is to try to um, obviously yeah, pursue a story that is important. And I feel that way about this and thanks for having me on and, and letting me uh, talk a lot <laughs> about it's okay it. there's a lot to talk about in this case and where's grandpa Valier? thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> thank you Dave thank you